Good afternoon. My name is Tom Bruner, and I'm the president and CEO of Glaucoma Research Foundation in San Francisco. Welcome to the Glaucoma Research Foundation's public webinar series for patients, What You Want to Know About Glaucoma. Today's webinar will discuss ways to get the most out of your next visit to your glaucoma doctor. This webinar is one way we reach out to those with glaucoma. Our website, our newsletter gleams, our other webinars, and our printed materials and educational resources are all available to the public for free through the generosity of our donors. In addition, philanthropic support allows Glaucoma Research Foundation to forward innovative research about glaucoma that leads us closer to a cure. Now it is my sincere pleasure to introduce our featured speaker for today, Dr. Tosin Smith. Dr. Smith is an attending surgeon at Glaucoma Associates of Texas. She is also a clinical assistant professor of ophthalmology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas and involved with the training of glaucoma fellows. Born in Nigeria, she received her Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery degrees at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. She then completed her surgical internship at the Washington Hospital Center before completing her residency at Howard University Hospital. Knowing that glaucoma is especially prevalent in people of African descent, Dr. T uh, Smith became interested in glaucoma and pursued a glaucoma fellowship at the Wills Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. Dr. Smith is also a physician ambassador for Glaucoma Research Foundation. With that, I'd like to turn our uh, webinar over to uh, Dr. Tosin Smith. Thank you very much, Tom, uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to be discussing seven ways that you can make the most of the next visit to your eye doctor. Uh, as glaucoma patients, uh, going to the eye doctor for a visit is uh, something we have to do because of the nature of the chronicity of glaucoma. And sometimes, in uh, going to the eye doctors, we sometimes leave there feeling that we uh, didn't accomplish all that we set out to do. So my talk today will be talking about ways that we can make the most of that visit to the eye doctor. As I said earlier on, uh, glaucoma is primarily a disease of the optic nerve with a resultant loss of visual field. So this is a disease that could potentially lead to loss of vision. The only modifiable risk factor that we know to treat glaucoma with for right now that's uh, documented and proven is probably by reducing intraocular pressure. Like most diseases that are chronic in nature, uh, it requires routine follow-up care for maintenance of control or stability, just like you would go get checked for your high blood pressure or your diabetes. Um, you would have to go get checked routinely for glaucoma as well. Sometimes this is to the eye doctor or any doctor at all could be overwhelming and it creates a situation where we don't get as much as we would like from our visit. A basic understanding of glaucoma as well as being prepared for our visit will help to alleviate some of the anxiety we'll feel and help us achieve much more from our visit than we routinely would if we went unprepared. Let's talk about glaucoma just for a few minutes before going on to talk about uh, what our, our topic for today is. An understanding of glaucoma can be achieved by talking to physicians or talking, reading brochures or articles or publications. One very helpful uh, book that I tend to give to my patients is a book that's it's a publication of the Glaucoma Research Foundation that's called Understanding and Living with Glaucoma. Uh, they find it very useful. It talks broadly about different types of glaucoma and ways to treat glaucoma. A good understanding of the reason behind the process at the doctor's office helps us to prov provide either pregnant information to the physician or their staff, but also helps us to ask the right questions. 
So that's one of the reasons why understanding the disease and the processes or what we do to either test for the disease or to follow uh, patients who have glaucoma will help us with our visits. As we know, with glaucoma, everybody's at a different stage of disease. There's people who have early disease, and there's people who have disease that's a little further along. And depending on when, where you are in the glaucoma continuum, as we have here, people who have early disease versus people who have more advanced visual field loss, um, what we need to do in the office would differ. For those of people, people who have early or pre-parametric disease, which is disease where visual field loss hasn't shown up or visual impact is not reflected yet. What we tend to do for them or to try and figure out where they have glaucoma is a lot different from what we would do for people who are further along in um, their glaucoma diagnosis, in which case um, they may have visual field loss that may be advanced in certain situations. And so the kind of test we would do for them will differ. So let's go straight on to preparing and going for a doctor's visit. I always say that preparation for a doctor's visit is always uh, paramount to the visit itself. Sometimes we forget what time our appointment was until we get that reminder from the doctor's office. So knowing your appointment time of day uh, will help you be better prepared for that. Also, knowing the amount of time you spend at the doctor's office will be helpful. Sometimes it's a short visit where you're just going in for a quick pressure check versus a longer visit where you will be dilated or you will be getting a field test. And allocating the right amount of time for the visit is essential. That way you don't feel rushed during the visit and you can be, you can then take your time to ask the appropriate questions or to get all of your needs attended to. Be punctual to your appointment and plan to go to bed early and have a good night's rest before your visit. Prior to your appointment time, especially if it's early on during the day, pack up your medication and your journal. And we'll talk a little bit more about the journal. And take something to read. If you don't like to watch TV, most doctor's offices do have a TV, but take something to read, take puzzles to work on, and something to need or whatever craft it is that you like to do. So as you wait to take your time at the doctor's office, you have plenty to do. A light meal prior to taking a test is essential. I tend to tell people who have a harder time in the afternoon, who normally would catch an afternoon nap, I ask them to take, uh, come earlier in the day when you're sort of more alert, and don't eat too heavy a breakfast, a light breakfast, so that in the morning if you are coming for something like a visual field test, you don't tend to feel sleepy during the test. This allows you to do your very best during the test and presents the need to have those tests repeated. Glaucoma testing. I'm just going to talk about testing a little bit so we understand why, uh, you know, I stress the preparation part and knowing the length and the duration of this. Glaucoma testing is essential to glaucoma care. Sometimes we do tests as diagnostic tests or to check progression or for both reasons. Some of those tests check stru structural, uh, the structural or the anatomy of the eye. Some of them are functional tests, and the other are theory tests that just add to helping us make the diagnosis or helping us solve the patient appropriately. This could be anything from measuring your corneal thickness to something most glaucoma patients don't like to do, which is like a visual field test. They take varying length of time and require different levels of concentration. Visual field tests tend to take a little longer and need more of your concentration than would maybe uh, something like central corneal thickness measurement. All tests, however, are useful and aid your physician in diagnosing and determining the state of your glaucoma. The next thing is the symptoms. So we're packed up, we're ready to go. Now, when I get to the doctor's office, the first thing you're going to be asked is they'll take a short history of what's happened in the past couple of months. And being aware or having a record of what's new is important. Do you have any new symptoms that may be related to the disease state itself? Sometimes people come in and they say, you know, I feel my vision is dim. That's 
that's something that people with advanced glaucoma may complain about. Or are you having side effects of medication? Is your eye red? Is it irritated? Is it itching? Or have you had surgery in the past and you've noticed that there's excessive tearing from the eye you had surgery in? Those are all complaints in there that you should be ready to produce or let the doctor's office know. Report symptoms to the doctor or their assistant. Usually the assistant may get the history from you and the doctor comes in the room and with the, with, without using electronic medical records, that usually should all already be in the computer. Sometimes I go in and the patient has kept the best part for me. But let the, let the uh, assistant know that way when he reads your history, he can see all the things that, uh, that have happened recently. Don't forget to update your glaucoma journal with symptoms and reactions between visits to keep track of occurrences. Because our visits are spaced out three to four months apart in certain instances, it's probably better that you write things as they happen so that you have a better memory of them. And glaucoma journaling is a good way of doing that. Medication. For glaucoma patients, um, Medication is a big part of what we still do for glaucoma care. Apart from lasers and surgeries, medication for glaucoma treatment has been around for a long time. My recommendation for medication, because you see, the outcomes or long-term outcomes, should I say, of the glaucoma disease is very dependent on how compliant and adherent people are with their medication. So, in order to make sure you're on top of your medicines and have a good understanding and make sure you're on the same page as your doctor's office. Bring to your medication, if possible, or an updated list of medicines, which includes the medicines and exactly how you do them. Check to see if you need refills on your medication, and that will be on the bottle. The label will tell how many refills are required. Request the medication instruction sheet if you need one. If you go to the doctor's office and and um, there's a change in the way your medicine is, med medication is, is prescribed, request a sheet. Most medical record systems are able to do that. That will give you a sheet that tells how to use the medicines in the right eye, the left eye, what time of day. We have one in our office. And we even color code it just to help you match it up to the, the bottle cap. We put only medicines that are added to your regimen by other doctors. Even if it's an injection to the steroid injection to a joint, a knee, or a neck, or the use of an inhaler for a short period in the springtime. These medicines could have an impact on your glaucoma, and it will be useful for your doctor to know, especially when there's something different going on with the glaucoma at that visit. Most of all, I would say be honest. It's hard to do. Be honest about how regularly you have been taking the medication. Sometimes we don't do our medicines as often as we think we do. Um, and because a lot happens in life these days. So if you haven't been using your medicines over a certain time frame as often as you think you need to, let your doctor know because then he won't institute, he or she won't institute change uh, to your medication regimen. It might give you some time to be better compliant and to be back for rechecking your pressure prior to changing your regimen. Now, progress. The next question is, how am I doing? Ultimately, that's why we go to the doctor's office, to find out how our glaucoma is doing and whether things are stable or not. So, what's my pressure today? Is my pressure within that range? I tend not to use the target number as a number. I tend to use target pressure as a range. It's a, a um, it's a, it, it's a certain range of expectation for pressure in any particular eye. It's a range that we watch pressure uh, at for a time frame. And I don't like to use a specific number and be fixated on it because pressure will fluctuate throughout the day. The other thing is pressure targets or ranges are not a lifetime thing. Sometimes we need to reset this goal or reset this target depending on what your glaucoma is doing. Was there any testing scheduled prior to or done during the visit? And how is that test doing? Many of the tests we do are tested to uh, check for progression of disease. And if we check for progression and you're stable, well, that's wonderful. But if something has changed, that may be, there may be need for discussion about that. Discuss test results with your doctors and their implications. What does it mean as my visual field has progressed? 
Does it always mean that I got worse than us? Not, not necessarily. Sometimes a change to the visual field may just be a fluctuation because it wasn't your best day to do the test. Don't forget to listen carefully as the doctor explains and give a summary of your visit. Sometimes patients miss exactly what the doctor is saying because they have questions lined up and because they don't want to forget to ask those questions. But there is time for that. And especially if you've come with a, your journal with your questions written out, then the tendency not to forget something is higher up. Bring someone along if you need a second set of ears. It gets overwhelming at the doctor's office, especially when uh, he, he's saying a lot of things that are different from just the routine. So a, a, a second set of ears are always helpful when you go to the doctor's office. And I would say, especially early on in the diagnosis, before you fully understand the implications of uh, glaucoma and what it means to have glaucoma, I would say um, go ahead and uh, bring someone um, along with you. Now, questions. I said there would be time for questions. Write your questions out in your journal so you don't forget. As you come to the doctor's office, don't forget that journal. That's one of the things you need to pack and bring along with you. As you go along, there are some of those questions that may easily be answered by the technician before you get to your doctor. So feel free to allocate the appropriate question to whoever it is in the office that may be helpful to you. This is a good time to discuss questions about new ways to diagnose or follow glaucoma. If you heard something from a friend or you read something in the paper that you think may apply to you, this is a good time to ask, say, doctor, what do you think about so-and-so regimen? If the doctor is fully aware, I'm sure he'll have that discussion. And if he's not, he'll say, I will get back to you once I, I, I look into that technology and let, let you know if it's something that, that I would recommend for you. This is also the time to ask about research studies and breakthrough available in glaucoma treatment. There are certain centers that carry out research, and if it's something you're interested in, usually they have it posted in their offices. The daily newsletter and the GRF website updates will be helpful also in keeping you updated on what's new with glaucoma. So just as a brief aside, there are several different things that are new in the way we treat glaucoma a lot are different from when I started practicing. There are new lasers, there are new ab internal and external mix procedures, there's new medications on the horizon, and, and there's different medication delivery platforms, different ways of you getting your medicines that are coming on the horizon. So it's an exciting time for us as glaucoma specialists because we have options to give our patients in terms of treatment. Now support. Um, as any chronic disease, especially one that could possibly be visually impairing, it's always important to know what your support group is. There are support systems available to help. It could vary from friends or a caregiver to support groups, local support groups uh, that patients with glaucoma could uh, plug into. The medical team at the doctor's office, including technicians and nurses, are part of your support group. I have the technicians at my office. If somebody said, I have a hard time remembering to put my drops in, the next question is, do you have a phone? And they will take your cell phone. Let me set an alarm for you. So if it goes up every day at this time, at least you'll know to remember to do your drop. It will be one extra thing to help to remind you. Low vision aids are also available for people who have visual impairment. And sometimes, you know, we just think, because we, we have some kind of visual impairment, we have to leave with it. There are low vision aids available, and a referral to somebody who is a low vision specialist could help you actually achieve a task that you've had trouble completing. The thing about low vision aids to remember, though, is that sometimes the, the different equipment or gadgets that they have may be task-oriented. So if you do decide to go to a low vision specialist, it's always important to write a list of those things that you are trying to achieve. Because the same piece of equipment doesn't, uh, it's not what you, what you would use for reading, it's not the same thing you would use for distance or you would use for cooking. Sometimes different devices are required. And so the most important things should be listed. 
There are also locally available resources for visually impaired that can be obtained from your doctor's office, from the Lighthouse for the Blind, or local Department of Rehabilitation Services. Uh, at my office, we have a list of things in the Dallas area that, and that list changes all the time. It changed from a time when people listened to audiobooks to now you can get stuff done on your phone and your computer. If you go to the Department of Rehab Service or Lighthouse for the Blind, people can help set up your phone where it speaks. And it's, it's just amazing the technology that's out there. So there are resources available locally uh, to help you achieve uh, certain goals that you may have set. Journaling. Journaling is great practice. It's important to use whatever device you're most comfortable with, whether it's writing an actual book or using your phone. It allows you to know the important details about your diagnosis. It allows you to keep track of appointments, medication-related information, or write symptoms as they occur. And um, also, you can write your questions down before your doctor's office, your doctor's visit. So that way, you go prepared without feeling like you left something at home. I would say being prepared for your visit allows a more efficient use of your time at the doctor's office as well as your physician. If you're prepared and you know what your needs are and your doctor's sitting right there, you're able to relate and he's able to answer your questions appropriately. And at the end of the visit, you feel like you're walking out with all your questions answered. It creates a certain preparedness that takes away some of the anxiety and stress that we may sometimes feel as we go to a doctor's visit. It also makes your visit productive and allows you to leave with a good sense of your disease state, which is ultimately why we go to the doctor's office. Most of all, though, it strengthens the physician-patient partnership that is necessary for providing an all and compatible care that is required with most chronic diseases. With chronic diseases, we tend to see our doctors often, and we tend to know our doctors well because we see them often. And being prepared on your end gives your doctor that reassurance that, you know, you're on top of this and you're, you're doing your very best. I want to thank you all for listening. And, I, and I, I got this picture recently. My kids went on a trip to Montana. They went on a camping trip and they took this, this picture of, um, uh, of this lake. And I thought it was so tranquil. And I'm hoping that the tip that I've given you today will at least keep you in this place of tranquility when it's time to go to the doctor's office. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tosin. That was just a great uh, overview, very comprehensive. And uh, we would like to open it up for any questions that uh, our participants may have. I have to say that uh, I really liked your final, well, I liked a lot of your slides, <laughs> but that final slide uh, talking about the partnership between a patient and the doctor, because as you point out, a, a lifetime, you know, glaucoma is a lifetime disease, and uh, the partnership with the doctor is critical, I think, uh, as you said, to the success. and. I, whenever I'm in a position to talk with patients, I, I try to emphasize that as well, that the more knowledgeable and the more prepared that we are as patients, the more interested, frankly, the doctor is going to be in answering our questions and helping because I think we all tend to want to work with people who are also participants. So if, if the patient is making the effort to do some research online or to read that booklet about understanding and living with glaucoma. And uh, I guess I could ask you, how many of your patients actually come in with a written journal? Uh, is that is it 5% or 50%? How, how successful are you to get your own patients to uh, come prepared? I would say about 20% of my patients do. Usually they're engineers. <laughs> <laughs> well, being and, an engineer, uh, I, I can empathize with that. They, so usually they're engineers. They're very detail-oriented, but it's very helpful to their visit. They come in, they're prepared, they have their questions. They, and so the visit goes, is really very well run because then uh, time is allocated to all the things. We're not spending time trying to figure out what medicines you're on and what refills you need and 
whether you're doing the drops the right way, because we know you are. You've come with concise information, and so we can spend time talking about, you know, what you're actually there for, which is your disease and whether you've progressed and, and all the things that you, you really want to know at the end of your visit. So it is helpful. And those people who do that, you know, uh, it, it's reassuring to me because I know that they're, they're, they're taking the time to, 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 to be involved in their own care. Well, I, I also um, encourage not just glaucoma patients, but any of us who um, may have any health issues that really no one will be more concerned about our health issues than we ourselves are. And whether it's uh, my back bothering me or, you know, something else going on and I go to the doctor, if I'm heard, uh, I get better care. And, and I think uh, it really does help. And I think the points you made today about taking that extra effort and coming to your doctor's visit with your questions and with your medications. And, and I love the journal idea. Um, and uh, I think it, it does lead to a better result. So in the long term, we as patients will benefit and we'll be able to preserve our vision for our lifetime, which is the goal, um, by working in a partnership with our doctor. So, um, I guess um, one question here uh, is um, uh, regarding the research, and I wonder if you can comment a little bit about what, in terms of the research going on out there, is there any area that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, there, there, there are so many exciting things going on in the glaucoma world right now. We've come from a time where options for surgery were just trabeculectomies and tube shunts, but now we have a host of mixed procedures that are still, that are either approved by the FDA or still in the pipeline. We have uh, drug delivery systems. We have new lasers. We have new drugs. It is just, it is a phenomenal time for glaucoma. One of the things that I would say I'm really excited about that, uh, that so many of them are still currently in FDA trials, is the drug delivery system. We know medication has been used to treat glaucoma for a long time, as Timolol is over 40 years old. But it's still very dependent on patients that have to do the drop. And uh, having to depend on how many drops you're on, if you have to take three different drops, it's a total of seven drops, seven to eight drops a day. Um, it, it does take out a chunk of your life just having to do drops repeatedly, and sometimes you do forget because we're all human. The medication delivery platform, some of those things take the, uh, the need for you to have to do your drops yourself every day out of your hands to a place where uh, medication is delivered either intraocularly or through a pontal plug or through a contact lens or through a ring or, you know, in different ways. So their implants will slowly release the medication to the eye to keep the pressure down in that range and takes that uh, burden of, of, of compliance and adherence out of uh, our hands, so to speak. And I think with better compliance, we would expect to see better stability in pressure. And for the long term, with less fluctuation in pressure and better stable pressure, then the likelihood of developing visual field loss and loss of vision from glaucoma is markedly reduced. And so I'm excited about that. Um, in addition to that, there are the MIGS, different MIGS options for surgery. So we're, we're, we're doing better in terms of the surgeries that we have available for people with glaucoma, especially glaucoma uh, that is not that is that glaucoma between early glaucoma and advanced glaucoma. And for a long time, there was a gap in treatment. And so mixed procedures are helping to fill that gap when you're not having to revert to a sort of a, a trabeculectomy or a tube shunt that is a little bit more invasive um, than many of these uh, mixed procedures are. So those, those two areas I would say I'm really excited about. Well, it's interesting that you talk about the drug delivery because, frankly, that's something that I think is really going to revolutionize glaucoma care because it, imagine, for example, let's just say for a discussion that it's a contact lens, 
uh, that that can be put in the eye once every three months, or uh, or maybe as you mentioned, a little tiny plug that goes in the in the drainage area of the eye, the punctum there where where tears yeah. drain, um, and you put a little plug in there that can last three months or four months, and not only do you maybe not have to take any eye drops, but the level of the medication is very low because it's being given continuously. So instead of putting one eye drop in once a day, where you have to put in a lot of medic medication and then it wears off over the day, and the next day you put in a lot of medication and it wears off again, here you have a system that is continuously delivering a very tiny amount of medication, and that also reduces side effects. Sometimes people get irritation from their eye drops or they may get a little redness. So these, the idea of a continuous delivery of medication that happens kind of automatically that we as patients don't have to worry about it um, is, is real. As you say, it, it's a, it could be a real breakthrough. And there's at least one of those, I believe the ring is FDA cleared. Um, and I think there are others coming. I think that one of the punctal plugs, and um, uh, there are also potentially uh, drug delivery systems that can be injected, actually a, a very tiny uh, fiber-like thing that you can inject into the eye with a, just a little pin prick with a needle and put it in, and then it will last, again, maybe six months, and it dissolves and is gone, and then you just put another one in. And so when you go in for your glaucoma checkup, you might be able to get your uh, glaucoma medications for the next six months at the same time, and that could be could be pretty nice. It is nice. And as you say, also um, by eliminating perhaps some of the day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week variations, we may end up actually even doing a better job of preserving vision. Which, you know, that's very hard to do the clinical testing to prove that. Uh, but that's maybe part of the result once we have a lot of those devices out in use and we can monitor those patients and tell if their glaucoma is perhaps more stable or if their visual fields or their vision is being preserved over the long term. So a lot of interesting things going on, and you're right in the middle of it. <laughs> it's a great time, I always say, to be a glaucoma specialist right now. We just, uh, we, we, we're thankful for all the options we have and all the research that's being done and, and all that's being put into improving the care that we deliver to glaucoma patients. Well, I think we're uh, pretty much gotten most of the questions. I guess that one other one that uh, I wanted to come back to was uh, the journal. And again, I, I have to say that um, my wife has had a few medical issues, for, fortunately not glaucoma, uh, but I usually go with her and I take my little pad with the questions that we've written down. Um, I have to say I'm not a, doing a very good job of keeping a journal for, uh, for her, but I have been attempting to prepare for the visits when we go in together. And I'm just wondering if you have some, you know, preferred, what's your preferred? Do you like the handwritten little notebook or you like it on the iPhone or do you have any suggestions about the types of things? Should one try to make an entry? at least once a week, or any thoughts about that journal? I, I would recommend uh, generally speaking a book, because then you can use it with the, with the rate of, at which Apple is changing my iPhone these days <laughs> to be able to update that um, um, your, your, your journal on your phone. Sometimes, depending on what happens to your phone, you could lose information that way. So if you have a little book or you have a way of transferring that information, saving it somewhere, even if you do it on your phone, but have everything safe kept somewhere because you could actually keep the same journal for many years. You could keep, and you could divide it by, by, by a book and just divide it up into things that have to do with diagnosis, things that have to do with medication or reaction, uh, you know, symptoms, just divide it into the big things. And then you date and you add to it as, as the need arises. Before it's research, you just go through anything that's new in the past three months, so you're prepared for your visits at that point. 
I would say whatever works the best for you. If you're somebody who is handy with your phone, use your phone. You can save it in, in the message section. Hopefully, maybe the GRF will come up with an app or something that might be helpful to patients to, to somehow create a, some, a journal, glaucoma journal, so they can people can put the information in and they can save it on all the Apple devices or something like that or in the cloud. And um, that way, um, you know, at any point in time, I, sometimes I see a patient that's in, a, in consult and I say, you've had glaucoma for 10 years. How high was your pressure when you were first diagnosed? And some people don't know. But it's something that I tell people when I first diagnosed you. I said, somebody's going to ask you this question 10 years from now. How high was your pressure when you were first diagnosed? That number is 25 or 27 or 30. Don't forget it. But we all will forget. Um, we, we know it was 30 something. So that's the place to just plug it in and you always have it and, and you reacted to a medicine in the past. You can always juggle that and be well aware that you react to it's Brimonidin, if it's, you know, Timolol for a reason. So that way um, somebody doesn't give you that drug because we're, we're somewhat limited in the classes of drugs that we're able to prescribe. So uh, I, I say whatever you have access to what works the best for you. I tend to like to write things down, and, and uh, so I like I prefer I prefer a book, um, but um, whatever works the best for you. Okay, well the um, I think that's really covered it pretty well. I was one other thing I was uh, interested in is you seem to be doing a lot with your practice there in Dallas in terms of support for patients, and you did mention the idea of uh, using low vision aids, and I know one glaucoma patient uh, who was a good friend could not live without his iPad, and he said, first of all, he can have the type as large as he wants, and since he has some vision loss, he uses large type, and then he can dictate instead mm -hmm. of having to type uh, his response, so he can do his email, and as you point out, the iPad can also, uh, it has uh, adaptions for reading your email to you, so you can yeah. listen to it. So there is a tremendous amount out there, and it sounds like in your practice you're able to help people or to refer them to the right places to get this, and I suspect most glaucoma doctors, if you, if asked, would be able to help with these things as well. Yeah, and many people don't think, patients don't think to ask at the doctor's office, but if you do ask, if there's things that you need to do that because you're impaired in a certain way, um, you'll be surprised. Um, I had a patient once that we sent to the lighthouse, and over there in the lighthouse in Dallas, there's a gentleman who is visually impaired himself, and he, you take your, your, your iPad and your cell phone, and he is able to set up all these things that just make life so much easier. So there, but you wouldn't know to go to get that done if, you didn't, if somebody didn't send you. So being aware that there are not only low vision specialists to help you with low vision aids, but also that there are people in, in, in either at the Department of Rehab Service or the Lighthouse that will help you uh, with there's a whole host of things out there that can help people who are visually impaired. And just being aware and plugged in and knowing you can call and say, okay, there's something here uh, that I can use, or being part of some kind of a support group um, that would say, um, you know, there's a support group or a chat group or something, and, and somebody has an idea and I like, you know, have you tried using this, this uh, magnifier or have you tried this, or they, they provide the service for people who are visually impaired. If you didn't know, uh, then you would be missing out on a service that's available to you. All excellent suggestions. Well, with that, I am going to um, thank you very much, Tosin, for this wonderful presentation and discussion. And I also want to thank our participants and those who called in for their participation. I would like to remind everyone to visit our website, which is just glaucoma.org, where you can request a free copy of the booklet that Dr. Smith talked about earlier, Understanding and Living with Glaucoma. Uh, you can also request our newsletter, which provides useful tips, everything from 
how to take an eye drop to what uh, is going on with the latest research. So uh, please take advantage of our website, and there is also a lot of information there on the latest research and research results uh, and the progress, as uh, Dr. Smith alluded to, in so many different areas. You'll, you can learn about that on our website. Uh, the teleconference, as I mentioned, will uh, it has been recorded and it will be on our website. And there are prior teleconferences and webinars on our website as well, where you may find other topics of interest. So thank you all again for joining us today, and a special thank you to Dr. Tosin Smith for sharing her ideas and, importantly, her time with us today. And with that, I will adjourn our webinar. Thank you all. Thank you.